Hi, this is Jeff Tate, and you're watching the 80s Metal Recycle Bin. You know, we, our plan was always to play live. It was just to be able to keep playing. And uh, obviously we were one of the only bands too that kept recording too. We put out a lot of material from 2000 on. And uh, we just, we want to stay on the road. We want to play live. And we know that bands our age, from the 80s, that's where we're going to make most of our noises from a live stage, you know, and uh, there's not a lot of radio and there's not a lot of TV for us, but if you were fortunate enough to come out of the 80s with a set of material to play everywhere in the world, that's where we're at, so we feel real fortunate. You know, I was kind of like a, a little bit ruthless on how I had to get going, and that meant if I was in a band and I didn't think they were going to end up in L.A. or didn't want to come to L.A. where everything was happening, all of the managers were here, the labels, everything was here. So if I found myself in a situation and I moved across the country in different bands and I had to just leave and they were really good friends, they were, everything was going good, we were playing a lot, but I knew in the end I had to end up in L.A. to get a major deal. and. Uh, that was just me going from one city to another, down to DC, over to Chicago, into Indianapolis, Salt Lake. And I mean, I made my way across and, and then ended up here in 77. If you come to LA, have somebody waiting for you. Have some situation waiting, something. Don't just come out here hoping to do something and uh, have somebody waiting. So I came out here and uh, in the 70s, there was a band called Angel and they were big in the 70s. and. Uh, those were a lot of friends of mine. And I came out and I started playing with a couple of members from that. And uh, we tried to get a record deal and it, we, we did the club scene and everything and uh, nothing happened. And so the people from Steppenwolf called me and said, do you want to come out on the road? And uh, we'll pay you some good money. And you come out on the road and play, just, just get our greatest hits album and listen to it. And I knew their songs anyways, I was a big fan. and. Uh, that happened like that. They called me, their drummer had left, they were already on the road, so I learned it and went right out with them for a couple of years. Yeah, because like in, uh, I had done a bunch of session work from like 81 to 83, and then I got, I went to, I was doing all kinds of sessions, whatever, I don't care, it was whatever, I'd go and do it. And um, this one session, there was a bass player there, and his, he was Greg Chasen, and he's a bass player from Badlands. And he was at that session doing it too. And we didn't know each other, and he told me, he said, uh, he, he call these people, they're getting ready to go in the studio with Gene Simmons and um, do an album on A&M. And I called them, and I got the gig, with Kale, and uh, I rehearsed with them and did a couple shows and went in the studio with Gene Simmons. We did the album at the old record plant and everything was going great. I mean, it was great. I it was moving right along. Kale had a lot of steam going on. And <clears throat> while I was in the studio, I uh, got a call. I had finished my drum tracks and all the backing vocals. I had finished, I was just there for mixing. and. Uh, it was Blackie and he said they were going out and uh, I was faced with a dilemma, but that's what I, I was telling you about being ruthless. You have to be kind of on yourself too. And you, it, I had this great situation going with Keel, Gene Simmons is sitting right next to me. It was a good deal with A&M Records and uh, I had to make this call and it was Wasp. They had a lot more going and it was a better opportunity for me and I had to just leave that. and. It was kind of hard for those guys when I left right away, but we're on better, we're on better relationships right now, but it was leaving one really good situation to go to a better situation.
That original Wasp that went out and did the first four albums, actually it was the first couple of albums because when we finished Last Command and we were storming around the world, the band was doing great. We were just kicking butt on stage. If we had to open for somebody, they had a hard time following us. That's how good the band sounded. And we were going all over the world doing it. And uh, that's it. Right after the second album, Blackie started breaking up the band. He fired Randy. And then after the third album, he fired me and then fired Chris. So it was a really good band that got broken up for no reason. But it was a terrific band. I had a good time in it. It was so brief. It was like I was living in a, an apartment and I couldn't play. And I had nowhere to play. So I went down to SIR and rented a room. And I'm playing by myself in the room. And, uh, and in comes Walking Tracy. And uh, I had seen him around town. He was, they were big Wasp fans. Him and the Guns N' Roses people, they were at all the Wasp shows. They loved Wasp, those bands. And, uh, I had no idea, but I knew that Tracy was a fan and I, I just bumped into him once in a while, but I didn't really know who he was. And he just said, I got, we just recorded our album and uh, do you want to check it out? And I said, what happened to your drummer? And they let their drummer go. And uh, it was a very similar situation to Wasp. They let their drummer go too. When I was doing the Kill album, they were doing their first album and then fired their drummer and I came in. Same thing with LA Guns. They fired their drummer after the first album. I came in and uh, we were doing clubs. So, you know, it was like I, I thought it had some steam and then I realized this whole new scene had taken over. I was involved with that first scene with Motley and Wasp and Rat and Dawkin. And then I, we realized this whole new scene with G and I, LA Guns, Fast the Pussycat. There was a new scene going on in LA and we were all on the road all the time. So, we had a lot of steam behind us because these guys had been playing around town. And boom, I had been in ever since. It was a thing where we were touring for five straight years from 87 to 91 and no breaks, even recording the albums during the tours. It was just crazy. And uh, when we did Hollywood Vampires, it came out in 91 and we went on tour with Skid Row to do all of Europe and Scandinavia. And uh, it was a funny thing because somebody came on the bus and I believe it was Trace. He came on the bus and he had, uh, never mind. And he said, check this out. And we were on tour, full blast. And we, you know, and we were like, wow, that's really, really good. And uh, we even started fooling around with a couple of things on stage, just jamming around on them because we really liked the album. And that was when we saw the change. Obviously, when we came back from that tour, we saw the change on MTV, saw the change on radio, and we saw that the scene was evolving, you know, at that point. And I was a little bit more accepting of it because I had already played in the 70s. So I saw changes anyways. I saw scenes start and stop. And, you know, there's like about a five-year window for longevity on a scene. L.A. was longer. L.A. was 10 years from 82 to 92. It was just dominant. And uh, I, I knew, I knew that it was going to peak at some point because I was older than the guys and so wasn't Phil Lewis. We were a little older. We had been through the 70s with record deals and stuff. And uh, we knew that it was going to peak at some point. If people get oversigned. They were oversigning bands. And, you know, it's just a crazy thing. And uh, it peaked. And we came out of that with, like I said, the set of material and the exposure that we needed. We needed what happened in the 80s for us and we were very fortunate because we were all over TV. So we have a set of material, like I said, that is recognizable, but a, a lot of people know it and we're one of the fortunate bands that came out of there so we could play live. And that's all we really wanted to do was always play live. Yeah, it takes a full decade for something to come around again and people say, wow, that was cool. Because in the 80s, obviously, we were looking at the 70s and going, you know, you look at it and then, you know, all of a sudden you start looking at it deeper and people started looking at 
the 80s and the body of music and work that came out of there. It was, it was a lot of uh, theatrics, a lot of showmanship, but there was a lot of great music that came out of there too. And like around 99, 2000, that's when things became uh, opening up again for bands from the 80s. And it was like right on track about what I thought it would take about a decade, but we played straight through there. We recorded straight through there. We didn't care if numbers dipped at all, as long as we can keep touring the world. It's a tough world out there for new rock bands. It's so tough, I feel for them. And um, there's no big machines. There's no big developing either, you know. That's a big thing people forget about is that when a band in the 80s, if you came out and sold 250,000 albums, 300,000, they were ecstatic. And they said, okay, now let's go for gold. Let's sell 600,000. And then boom, let's try to get that platinum. And it was a, there was people working with you and there was a vision going on. Right now, if you get signed, you better hit straight out of the box. You better hit a home run or they'll start tailing off from you. So I feel for them. The one good thing about for rock bands for today is the internet. You could take some of it back. You can make some stuff happen on your own. You can sell product. You can have web pages and merchandise. And you can pretty much run your own little industry out through the web. So that's one good thing for the bands. But uh, our future is playing live. Mm -hmm.